Nigerian journalists deserve better deals, says the National Human Rights Commission. And on the issue of zoning, there have been calls for South presidency, and that has intensified. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anako. The National Human Rights Commission has said that Nigerian journalists deserve a better deal in the discharge of their constitutional duties. According to them, the press, which battled hard to return Nigeria to its current democratic status and continues to struggle to sustain democracy and development, has to be supported in order to successfully execute its constitutional duties as the society's watchdog. Now, the International Press Centre, uh, the IPC, on the occasion of this year's World Press Freedom Day, also joined the global community to raise concerns about the press freedom violations. Well, joining us to discuss this and more is Wemimo Adeomi. She is a broadcast journalist and she's the host of Table Talk on 99.3 Nigeria Info Lagos. And also joining us is Sunny Dada. He's the head Free Expression and Pluralism Institute for Media and Society. And he's also a Rotary Peace Fellow. Thank you very much, gentlemen and lady, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start with you, Sonny, before I go to Wamimo. Um, can you say for certain that um, Nigeria is a press-free country? Now, I'm asking this question because you have traveled to other countries as a journalist, and you have seen how media is being practiced in other countries, comparing Nigeria to other countries on the continent. How free can you say that the press, the average pressman, is? Um, well, um, thank you, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Mariana, and once again, good evening um, to your audience. Um, there are a number of issues regarding press freedom in Nigeria, especially when uh, you compare the practice, um, <clears throat> the way it is done in other climates, like you said. Uh, but uh, the summary is that uh, we are still not free. Um, uh, there are a number of factors we're going to be looking at, factors such as... Uh, factors that has to do with the environment uh, the practice environment and the legal environment um, within the legal environment we still have policies we still have laws that uh, continue to interfere or continue to uh, deplete uh, freedom of expression laws that continue to gag the press laws that continue to stand as uh, hindrances to access to information and even free expression uh, within the practice environment, we still have issues that has to do with safety of journalists. Uh, we still contend with issues that has to do with uh, uh, um, uh, welfare of journalists, uh, you know, uh, and all of that. So when you put all of this together, uh, you see that we are very, very far from being free. Um, we've seen what's happened in several countries in terms of journalists, I mean, let's still stay with the, uh, the African continent. We've seen journalists being jailed in, in Egypt. We've seen um, journalists being jailed in some parts of Central Africa, in South Africa, East Africa, even in West Africa. And we've also seen the media somewhat not, you know, run the stories of happenings within their domain within Africa. But in Nigeria, we still see the media reporting on certain things, even though we're still asking for a level of freedom. Now, let's talk about the management of our media space. Uh, in the past few months, even last year, we've seen several bills um, come out in terms of um, how the media should be managed. We saw the social media bill. We saw the media bill. Uh, a lot of water under the bridge as at today. Um, how do you think that we as journalists and even the Nigerian people that we broadcast to, being also the fourth estate of the realm, have been able to influence the management of the media in Nigeria? Um, well, I'm happy that you have made a reference to, <coughs> excuse me, to the um, um, regulatory framework. What you just talked about you, uh, has to do with the regulatory framework. <coughs> For instance, do you know that yeah, um, there is still um, an amendment proposal to the uh, National Broadcasting Commission Act, which is the NBC Act, uh, <clears throat> at the National Assembly. And uh, there is a provision in that proposal 
that talks about <coughs> digital access. Now, uh, this digital access says that um, any moment, once, that, once the amendment becomes a law, that uh, every Nigerian will have to pay for digital, uh, digital broadcast content. Now, that is not a challenge. The challenge is that the money that will be generated from that uh, 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 payment will be shared among uh, um, three tiers. The signal distributor, the regulator, which is the NBC, and national broadcast entities. Now, the signal broadcaster and the signal distributor will take 40 percent. The um, regulator will take 40 percent. The national broadcasting entities will share 10, 10 percent. Who are the national broadcasting entities? The uh, FRCN and the NTA. So it means that even though Nigerians can assess your content plus TV content, you will not have any right. You will not have any share of the money they are going to pay. So there is a systematic uh, uh, um, strangulation, you know, of the private sector, of the private uh, broadcast media that is as represented by IBON, the Broadcast Organization of Nigeria. So um, then again, there, is also there are also challenges with the regulator when you talk about regulatory independence and uh, financial independence. All of these things are elements of um, 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 <clears throat> control mechanism, you know, on the broadcast industry even if you look at the proposed NPC Act, but I don't want to go there now because there is so much focus on the, the broadcast sector. So the regulatory independence, for instance, that the NBC lacks, where, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Director General of the Commission will still have to take permission from the Minister for Information and Culture, you know, if he, if he has to do his work. In other words, if you look at the NBC Act, under the second schedule, <clears throat> under the first schedule, rather, it talks about where the Minister for Information and Culture can give directives to the Director General, irrespective of what the directives are. Which means that if, um, uh, if the Minister for Information and Culture, for instance, wakes up one morning and uh, uh, no longer feels comfortable with Plus TV, all he needs to do is just to call the DG and tell the DG to either revoke your license mm. or to shut you down or to issue a warning. And uh, to us, it, it's, a, it's a strategy, it's a control mechanism on the media, you know. And again, if you look at the uh, 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 um, mode of appointments into the commission, appointments are done directly by the executive. We are saying that that is a control mechanism. Appointments should be done by the National Assembly with contributions from stakeholders within, drawn from the industry. Hmm. They, um, among those on the board, on the NBC board, you have the presence of the DSS. We, we keep asking, why is the DSS on the board of the NBC? Hmm. So we we'll continue to we we'll continue we, we we keep on we we'll continue to talk about it. Um, let's also you know deviate a bit to the policy angle. You hmm. know, if you look at uh, Section 95 of the recently uh, passed Electoral Act, <clears throat> the, the the 2022 Electoral Act. When you look at section 95, I think from uh, 2, 2 to 4, when you read, you will discover <clears throat> the kind of draconian penalties that are stated there, targeting individual journalists, targeting the, 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 the media house. Um, that is, if there is a failure to provide um, fair and equitable coverage for every political party in the electoral process. Mm -hmm. There are very severe draconian penalties that have been put in place, you know, some of which has to do with you know, payment of fines running into millions of naira, some of which has to do with, you know, jail terms, prescribed jail terms, and all of that. So what so, I see, so what I see from all that you're laying out is a lot of arm twisting by the government yes, or the leadership. Yes, that, 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 that's what we are talking about. So when you talk about uh, press freedom, I'm laying all of these issues on the table because um, I listened to um, um, the interview granted by uh, the Minister for Information and Culture when uh, the <clears throat> World Press uh, Freedom Index was uh, released uh, a few weeks ago, you know, I listened to him where, where he mentioned a number of things, where he said that the media in Nigeria is free, that it is only in Nigeria a national daily decided to, um, took a decision that they will no longer describe or uh, um, um, uh, uh, call the president a president, but that they are going to, you know, <clears throat> call him by his uh, military title, which is general. You know, that if it were in other climes, they would have shut down that media station. 
you know so I, i'm just laying all these tables on the ground to let everybody know that it is not because that we're not seeing uh, journalists being thrown into jail at all times even though we have seen some you know the agba jalingo case the showere mm -mm. case and all of that the john sabiri we can go on and on we will get to but, that point we will get to that point yeah. but i want to toss to Wemimo. um Wemimo, i'm gonna put you in a box that you probably not like being a woman being in this um you know, business, being on the field, a journalist, you host a show alone. You do not have a pair, uh, a guy, you know, sitting next to you to make it look like, um, you know, you have somebody to protect you. You're doing the show alone. You're, I want to quote you, you break tables on your show. Now, looking at what Sunday has said, especially with, you know, um, coverage and certain things that would attract fines. How easy has it been for you, um, you know, existing in this particular field as a woman journalist? Uh, when we were, did, did you hear anything I said? Uh, I think that um, we lost connection. Well, um, to be very frank, I'll oh, start off by saying that the president. Uh... Go ahead. Yes, I did. Can you hear me? Yes. One more, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Well, I think that we're having a little connection issue with uh, women. Well, we'll try to see what we can do to fix that uh, and get her back in. Uh, but let me come back to you, Sunday. So we were talking about these issues of, you know, the laws that might, uh, or bills that might become law. Now, what is the media doing about this? Um, and if you notice that most of these draconian laws that you, or clauses and phrases within these bills are mostly targeted at the broadcast media. Um, the print seems to be, you know, enjoying some certain, certain level of freedom, especially during the NSAS situation. Media houses were the most, uh, the hardest hit. But then the, pre the, the print media just went ahead to print whatever they wanted to. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, your observation is quite correct. And, um, and uh, um, it is not, um, I think it has, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it has... A history, you know, uh, the print has always been uh, traditionally very vibrant. Um, if you look at the years of uh, dictatorship in this country, um, it was a print, even though the media would take the glory, the entire sector would take the glory. But if you look at it, very, you, you discover that the print, you know, actually fought the battle, took the battle to the uh, doors of the uh, military. So uh, traditionally, the print has always been that, you know, vibrant and even more difficult you know, in terms of regulation, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> but let's look at why there is so much interest on the broadcast media. You know that more people listen to the broadcast, the broadcast media compared to the print. And that's because of issues of illiteracy, mainly. You know, um, the average header, the average farmer goes to the farm with a small radio, you know, <clears throat> where he can listen to news and all of that. But he doesn't have the luxury of, you know, buying a newspaper every day. And especially in communities where uh, the literacy level is not so good. So mm -hmm. it is normal that people will uh, turn towards the broadcast media. And because broadcast media will naturally get such attention, uh, is, uh, naturally get a, a bigger audience, it is expected that there will be so much attention from uh, regulators and policy makers, you know, uh, on the uh, broadcast um, sector. Now, you talked about what um, <clears throat> journalists are doing or media organizations are are doing. Um, the, the Broadcasting Organization of Nigeria, BORN, um, I, I remember that also made submission last year during the uh, proposed amendment hearing. The public, there was a public hearing, and I know that I can still remember that BORN was fully represented. Uh, my organization was also, uh, for, as a matter of fact, we organized, uh, before that hearing, we held uh, a national summit where we brought together uh, the Broadcasting Organization of Nigeria and the members of the NBC, where we had um, a proposed uh, amendment, you know, to some of the clauses that we think uh, that uh, limit media freedom, you know, and by, you know... And has, has there been a follow-up? Because it's one thing to put out, a, you know, um, 
amendments or adjustments, but is there a follow through? Because, I mean, if we want something done, we have to go ahead and get it done ourselves. So are we putting uh, uh, that much pressure? Of course. Uh, of course, of course. There, there is a follow up. A lot of things are, uh, a lot of work have been, uh, has been done, you know, at the background. A lot of things uh, have been done, you know. Uh, the engagement is still ongoing. You know, we um, <clears throat> uh, broadcast the broadcast uh, organization of Nigeria, for instance. You know, uh, recently held uh, their what do you call it? Is it the annual conference or so? Where they also laid these issues before the director general of the commission. You know, and all of that. So uh, things have been done, even though um, a lot could have been done better. You know, and uh, if things are not moving the way they are supposed to move, you should also understand why. You mm. know, there are political dynamics, there are cultural dynamics, there are religious dynamics, a lot of dynamics, you know, involved in uh, this. Then the ownership, uh, ownership dynamics, you know, and all of that. So when you put all of these things together, you would, uh, you would understand, of course, why things um, uh, uh, may not move the way ordinarily they should move. But okay. I, I like to let you know that, I like to let you know that stakeholders are not um, keeping quiet, uh, stakeholders are talking. Uh, if not that we spoke out, you know, the social media bills you earlier talked about, you know, would have, be would have become lost by today. Mm. And then maybe we may not even uh, be having this discussion, this conversation by now, I, you know. So, uh, so, so uh, work is ongoing and, uh, and that's why it's good that we continue to talk about it, you know, at every opportunity we have, we talk about it, okay. you know. Okay. to draw the attention of, you know, uh, policy makers and stakeholders. All right, I think we have Wamimo back. Uh, Wamimo, can you hear me now? Uh, uh, unfortunately, we lost you for a second. Uh, Wamimo, can you hear me? I think that we are having connection problems with Wamimo. Unfortunately, Wamimo, we apologize. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the internet is on your end is uh, a bit shaky. But... Let's talk about the working conditions. Remember that you mentioned it uh, in the opening, the working conditions. I go to places sometimes when I'm telling stories or, um, you know, interviewing people. They, the, half the time they say the media is not doing their job. You're not doing investigative journalism. We need you to do more investigative journalism. So I'm going to throw it to you. Why are we not having more investigative journalism stories? And also, I see also that we are lacking in follow-ups. You know, we, we put out a story, it's great, it gets the kind of reaction that we want, but then there's never really, you know, follow-through. You know, there are no follow-ups uh, to continue to develop that story. What do you think the major challenges are in terms of, you know, following the stories wherever it goes? Yes, I, I remember that when I started, I talked about the practice environment. And uh, <clears throat> I talked about welfare, you know, in the practice environment. I talked about safety of journalists. Um, I, what I didn't talk about is um, professionalism, the issue of professionalism. Um, journalism presently in Nigeria uh, is suffering uh, uh, massively, uh, you know, um, from the challenge of professionalism. Um, journalism, we used to say, uh, when I sit down with, uh, you know, colleagues and we talk about journalism you know in fact um a few months ago we were in accra for african freedom of expression uh, annual general meeting and uh, there <clears throat> excuse me you know we were just having a conversation uh, regarding journalism in nigeria and uh, it was it became very clear that journalism in nigeria is an all commerce affair why is it an all commerce affair it's only in, in, in journalism where you um see somebody who read an engin engineering course or maybe a medical cause, you know, you know, practicing as a, either a broadcaster or a reporter, you know, doing stories, you know. Um, somebody who probably read psychology in school, you know. So there is the lack of, um, um, what should I say, standardization, you know. So uh, these, all of these things, you know, uh, pose a very serious challenge, you know, in terms of staying on stories and following up on stories. You know, it is not enough to break the story. We say stay on the story. But what about the environment in which you work in? Because it's yes, one thing I, I, to... I'm coming to that. I, I'm, com I'm, coming to, I'm coming to that. I, I'm just, you know, painting a picture um, of the professional uh, landscape, you know. Now, other issues within the environment, which has to do with welfare of journalists, 
uh, and that is also key when you talk about press freedom you know most times we look at the policy issues which most times look like the bigger issues but the actual issues you know has to do with welfare of journalists if a journalist is hungry of course <laughs> it will be very easy to compromise him you know we have a lot of media houses that no longer pay journalists they, they, we have a very a very big national daily i don't want to mention name where they give you the ID card and they tell you that the, I, this identity card we have given you is your meal ticket. Invariably, what are they saying? You know, go out to the field, collect brown envelopes, bring the story and all of that. Hmm. So how do you do serious investigative journalism in such environment? For God's sake, the journalist is a human being. You know, he's a product of the society. So if he's coming back home, his children expect to see bread, you know, expect to see him coming back home with bread. You know, they have to be, he has to put food on the table. So if you don't pay his salary, if you don't give him, you know, the, 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 the right um, 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 motivation, it is expected that naturally he work out something for himself, either by, by any means, you know. Then how many media organizations, how many media houses still buy work tools for their journalists? For instance, midgets. You know, I know a lot of journalists in Port Harcourt who bought midgets with their own money to do their own work. They pay their transport to bits, you know, mm -hmm. and all of that. So when you put all of these things together, you know, all, the, all of these challenges that the average Nigerian journalist is grappling with, of course, we, we, cannot, we, we can say that he is trying, you mm -hmm. know, because... It is our thinking that some of these things are also deliberate. They are a way of, you know, gagging, you know, the journalist from doing his work, you know, um, uh, limiting his potential, you know. So when you talk about investigative journalism, why there is an absence of investigative journalism, I'm trying to let you know that there is a lot of investment okay. you need to put in before you can do a serious investigative journalism. Okay. All right. With, let without me just, risking let, let, your life. All right. Let me just try again. I think we now have Wemimo joining us on the phone. Wemimo, can you hear me? Yeah, clearly. Uh, apologies. Welcome, you welcome to the, yeah. the connection uh, services in Nigeria. But <laughs> let me go back to the question that I asked earlier on. I mean, I'm sure that you listened to most of the things that Sonny said. Um, yeah, most importantly, true. as a woman who is operating in the, in the environment that we find ourselves, knowing how hostile it is, knowing how competitive, very competitive it, uh, it is, how easy do you think um, for you it has been? Uh, and would you say that that would be the case of every other woman? And he's also painted a picture of the fact that um, some people, for some people in, in Nigeria, your identity card is your meal ticket. Um, how do you even get respect um, as a journalist if this is how we're seen? All right, thank you, Maria. So I must say that uh, I've listened to what my uh, other per the other person has said, and I, I must disagree with some of those points. I think we have quite a notion that we have, do not have enough professionals in Nigerian media. I totally disagree with that. I've been in this uh, sector for about 12 years, and also as a media trainer, I can tell you that we have quite a number, a huge number of professionals in this, in this country. We have people who have done massive stories that generated impact in their local communities. We also have both local NGOs, media NGOs, and international funding stories. I've done quite a number of investigative reporting stories. I've trained about 300 journalists in this country across southwest Nigeria, and I can see the impact of the work that they're doing. The challenges are there, and I know that, I mean, in terms of funding uh, and getting resources to go further, uh, one of the biggest problems I see, though, is the lack of training for journalists. So in most media houses, there isn't a plan to train journalists or there isn't a funding, uh, there isn't soft funding for stories. So most journalists need to go get uh, grants to run their own stories. Uh, that might be one of the biggest challenges. But I think that despite this, that we still have journalists who hold their head high. I, I, I mean, I work in this space every day, and I must say that I'm entirely proud of my colleagues across both uh, broadcast, digital, and uh, print media. I see them challenging status quo. It's a very tough terrain to work in in Nigeria. I mean, um, we have rankings showing that Nigeria is one of the worst countries in which uh, you can ever work as a journalist. That's scary enough. I've had investigative stories that I first to drop because they were targeted against my children. You know, um, 
And again, like you pointed out, being a female in this industry, yeah, there, are, there are even much more limitations uh, because you have a lot more things to consider than, uh, you know, a man rules. But, I mean, it is a job. And those of us who have sworn to uh, defend this country and to uphold the truth and uh, also give a voice to the yearnings of the people, we keep at it every day. I must say that when I heard the president uh, say yesterday, telling his media aides to make information available to journalists, I think that tells you the situation of things. If it mm. takes a, a commander-in-chief to give a directive to make information available, then you know that we have a big problem. I have had to chat to make use of the Freedom of Information uh, Act, and I must tell you that it was quite a challenge. For government at all levels, they see journalists as their enemies. I've had government officials ask me to my face, which party do you work for? Why do you want to know? I mean, I was simply asking information about the number of schools that we have in Lagos. That appears um, in no course, but apparently I was told to my face, why do you want data unless um, our opponent has sent you? So that's the eye with which most government officials approach issues. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, this is one of our biggest problems. Mm -hmm. um, this is what leads to the stifling of the media. You see laws that are apparently, apparently uh, raised to, to deter freedom of the press. So giving a directive is not enough. We need to see the action. We need to see that, indeed, I can tell a story without my life being threatened. Um, mm -hmm. After the NSAS, many media organizations were sanctioned for even covering the NSAS protest. Tell me about the freedom of the press. Mm. Interesting, because we're almost out of time. I'll just pose this last question to you, Emima. I've seen journalists disappear. I've seen many arrested, bullied. I can never get that video out of my head of uh, FFK and a journalist um, who asked him, who was funding, you know, his, or who was bankrolling him. And we saw the reaction that he got. Um, we've seen all these kinds of things happen. Do we see us as a country, um, you know, do you see a time where Nigeria will go past this, you know, situation that we've seen ourselves in? I mean, most people would tell you that it's better today, but will we see a better uh, and freer press in Nigeria telling the stories as it is without fear or favor or somebody calling your boss and telling him to fire you? Well, I can only hope. I mean, that's the same way everybody will hope. I can only sincerely hope. But I think that um, journalists need to raise their head high. I'm, I'm a very proud broadcast journalist. Um, and I think that government officials who have crossed my path, they know very clearly where, what my stance is. I demand respect and I give the same. I think the most journalists also need to do so. Um, as much as you give respect to government officials, you must also demand respect. But this is made difficult by media buying. I mean, a lot of media houses, uh, they're greatly influenced by government officials. So um, I'm certain the instance you refer to, that journalist is possibly afraid of picking up and then getting back to his media house and there isn't a support for him back home. So he doesn't want to lose his music care, so he simply uh, keeps quiet as he's ordered to. Mm. Can we get better leadership? I think we can. If we have citizens, um, you know, become stronger, make their voices stronger, join the media. I always advocate that the job is not just for the media, but that we need to have a strong citizenry that mm. demands good governance. That helps the media even do their job better. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you. Wemi Madoni is a broadcast journalist, host of the, uh, Table Talk on 99.3 Nigeria Info Lagos, and Sunny Dada is head, Free Expression and Pluralism Institute for Media and Society, and he's also a Rotary Peace Fellowship. Thank you so much, guys, for being part of the conversation. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll continue to talk about the issue of zoning and power rotation. Stay with us.